Okay, so today's topic is going to be all about what we call the cell cycle, and then this process known as mitosis that you've probably heard about from middle school, and you unfortunately have to learn some of the steps leading up to it. So during a cell's lifetime, so this is throughout the cell's entire lifetime, it's going to grow and reproduce lots of times, okay? And this takes place over usually a longer period of time than you might think, um, but you know, it's not a full organism, right? So basically this whole process of it growing and reproducing and doing that multiple times, we call that the cell cycle, okay? And it's basically a really, really complex set of stages and it's highly regulated. And so what we mean when we say that is the cell is very careful about when it enters each stage. And that's gonna be really important for the organism as a whole because if you mess up those checkpoints and you stop being so careful, then you can cause a lot of harm. And so we're gonna talk about what happens when the cell cycle goes wrong. Now, this diagram that I started you off here shows you what the cells and their chromosomes and the nucleus look like during each stage. Okay, so we have the G1 stage, the S stage, the G2, and the M stage. And then by the end of the M stage, we've made a second cell. And then that cell has its own cell cycle. So like if I really wanted to be uh, accurate, I would then start to have this guy having his own cycle, right? And then that would eventually result in another cell. And then he would have his own cycle, right? And it just keeps going, okay? So don't get too bogged down in what's happening in each of these images yet. We're going to be talking about that a lot, but just kind of looking at all of it, it's a little overwhelming. Just realize that it looks pretty different in lots of these phases, right? So here's another diagram that you'll see quite a bit. This is a more simplified form. And basically most of the cell cycle is spent in what we call interphase, okay? So it's called interphase because it's between phases and specifically it's between phases of mitosis, okay? So this is between cell divisions. So what I have here is all of those stages that I was listing off before. I have the G1, the S, the G2, and the M phase. And then around that, I have the exact same things, except I've lumped all of those together under interphase, all except for the mitosis phase. So interphase is really made up of the G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase, okay? So interphase is just another term for all of these. So if you were to say a cell was in interphase, that means it could be in G1, it could be in S, or it could be in G2. And we're gonna talk about why you might refer to a cell as being in interphase, and also how to recognize that a cell is in interphase. So during interphase, this is really when the cell is doing its thing, okay? This is when it's actually doing its job the only time it leaves interphase is when it's ready to multiply, to create a second cell, right? To create two daughter cells, and we'll talk about that. But when they're in interphase, they're gonna be making proteins because they need that to do their job. They're going to replicate their DNA. So they're gonna copy their DNA. And that's gonna become really important when we actually get to the mitosis step of the cell cycle. So keep that in mind that they are going to make extra copies of their DNA. And sometimes they're gonna increase their organelles, so their organelle count. So if for instance, you were a liver cell, uh, the liver cell is responsible for a lot of, you know, detoxifying and breaking down hazardous materials. So if you were a liver cell, you may wanna increase the amount of peroxisomes or lysosomes, something involved in breaking stuff down. Okay? And maybe you don't need a huge vacuole, right? So just know that each cell, depending on its function, is gonna need a different structure. And that's been a theme that we've seen throughout this entire year so far. But again, just to reiterate, interphase has those three stages of G1, S, and G2 in that order. Okay? So within each of those phases, different things are happening. That's why they're not just referred to as interphase. They also have their own little distinctions. So during the G1 phase, G stands for growth. Okay. This is a period of growth and also when the cell starts to add some organelles and really kind of try to become the cell that it needs to be in order to do its job. During the S phase, the S stands for synthesis. Okay. 
That is when it's going to copy its DNA, also known as replicating its DNA. And that doesn't mean a lot to us at this point, but it's going to become absolutely essential for multicellular organisms and even unicellular. And then there's the G2 phase, which does involve some more growth. And so this is where it's actually preparing for mitosis. So it is still a growth, growth phase, and it's basically getting ready to split. Okay? Because if you want to split into two cells, and you want them to be about the same size as you started with, then this guy's going to have to get much bigger. Okay? And so, again, everything that I just talked about, G1, S, and G2, are all part of interphase. So what I just outlined in red there is interphase. Okay? So once that's done, it will undergo mitosis. And so mitosis is going to result, the big idea of mitosis right now, is that it results in two identical daughter cells. So they're called daughter cells. Okay, and that's an important vocab term. And they are identical, meaning that their DNA is the exact same. Their size should be the exact same. Their DNA should be the exact same, unless something went wrong. Okay? So throughout all these diagrams, you're going to see terms like chromosome condensation and nuclear envelope breakdown and stuff like that. And I want you to think about what's happening here, but we haven't really gone into chromosomes yet at this point. So I don't want you to worry about it so much as just focus on the visuals because these are chromosomes okay, in each of these visuals. And so you do need to understand what's happening, but you don't need to understand what those chromosomes necessarily are. Okay other than the fact that they are DNA. And so, as I said, cells have different jobs depending on where they are and what they need to do, right? So when a cell kind of becomes what it needs to be, we call that cell specialization or cell differentiation. Huh? And so you kind of all start out the same. So most cells start out the same. We start as stem cells of some kind. Okay? And those stem cells are like blank canvases. They can become depending on the type of stem cell, they can become either anything or they can become lots of things, okay? There's some diversity in what they can become. So a stem cell may become a muscle cell or it may become a blood cell or a nerve cell or a cardiac cell, a liver cell or an intestinal cell. It can become lots of different things. Like look at the di diversity here and it all came from the same kind of cell, okay? So when cells actually specialize, they now have their job, okay? So now my cell is a muscle cell and it's going to act like a muscle cell. It's going to have a lot of mitochondria because I need a lot of energy. Okay? Whereas my intestinal cell may need less mitochondria, and we need those microvilli. We need lots of surface area. Okay? So just something to start thinking of. And any time that a cell specializes and it's started to go through that G1 phase, um, it's, it's entered interphase, right? It, it's starting to do its job. And then when that cell needs to divide, it will eventually enter the mitosis phase. Okay? But while it's doing its job, we call it still part of interphase. Okay? So here's yet another representation of this cycle. And I really like this image for a few reasons. Okay? So first off, there are some checkpoints. And this is so important. So a checkpoint Think of it as a big old traffic light. Okay? It is saying, are you okay to go on? Can we give you the green light? Okay? So let's think about a new cell. A new cell starts out in the G1 phase. It's growing, it's increasing its organelle count, all that stuff, right? It's gonna hit this checkpoint. Now this checkpoint is designed to make sure that everything during G1 phase happened okay. You do not need to know exactly what needs to happen, but it's the G1 phase, so it grew a lot. It added some organelles, stuff like that. So did it do that properly? Yes or no? If it did, then that's great. We can pass through and move on to the S phase. Okay, so now at this point, I am now in the S phase. You can see the slight color change there. Okay, so now I'm in the S phase. So... The S phase is going to eventually go to the G2 phase, right? And then the G2 phase has its own checkpoint, its own little red light right here. And this is a really important checkpoint because this is the checkpoint that is right before mitosis. Okay? Now, it's not the mitosis checkpoint 
So it's not the quintessential one, but you're going to see why it's so important that all of these checkpoints are working. So the G2 checkpoint is just going to make sure that the S checkpoint went okay, or the S phase rather went okay, and the G2 phase went okay. Did it grow enough? Did it copy its DNA? And then we're going to hit the M checkpoint, and this is like our final stop. This is our, okay, this is our last chance, because if I tell this thing to reproduce and it's not ready to reproduce, we're going to have some problems. Um, so the G1 checkpoint will really check and make sure that the internal and the external of the cell conditions are accurate, are adequate rather, and good for cell division. So everything's doing okay. I've gotten some organelles in there. I've gotten bigger, all that. The G2 checkpoint is going to make sure that your chromosomes have been replicated and that your DNA is safe and sound. And then the mitosis checkpoint, the M checkpoint, is going to make sure that your chromatids are correctly attached to spindles. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Okay, but it kind of happens after mitosis has started, but before mitosis finishes. Okay. Now, this is all how we control the cell cycle. And your book talks about this term cyclins. So cyclins are basically going to be the molecules that are responsible for regulating that cell cycle. So if you look here, I have concentration on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, I have the cell cycle itself. I have the four phases of the cell cycle. Okay, so I have interphase, which is made up of the G1, S, and G2 phase. And then I finally have mitosis, right? So there are different cyclins. They're labeled with different letters. So there's cyclin D, cyclin E, cyclin A, cyclin B, right? There's more. But I don't need you to memorize, oh, cyclin E comes right before the S phase. Cyclin A comes right during the G2 phase. I don't need you to memorize that. What I do need you to understand is that cyclins are responsible for regulating the cell cycle. Okay? And there are different kinds. And you'll often see a huge jump in concentration at those checkpoints. So cyclin E is going to be responsible for the G1 and S checkpoint. Now cyclin D might be involved too because its concentration is pretty steadily increasing at this point, right? But cyclin E has this huge hike right as we hit that G1 checkpoint. So clearly there's something going on here. I don't need you to memorize why that happens or anything like that. Just know that cyclins will increase in concentration as their checkpoint approaches. Okay. Now, you're going to see this mitosis promoting factor, which is one of those cyclin dependent complexes. Okay. So we have cyclins, and then we have the things that cyclins interact with, which are cyclin-dependent kinases, CDKs. And I don't need you to memorize that term, but the mitosis promoting factor is just one of those systems, so one of those things I was just describing. And this will determine whether the cell enters mitosis or not. Okay? And so this, this cyclin has to increase to a high enough concentration in order for it to interact with the CDK properly. And so if it doesn't get that high, so if it only gets like right here, then it's not going to undergo mitosis. Okay? It has to go all the way up to this point. Okay? And this is a good thing in that it helps make sure that we don't have mitosis going when we don't want it going. Okay? So you'll notice that every time mitosis is happening, so that's these blue sections here, you will see an increase in the MPF. That's our cyclin, okay? Or the MPF cyclin, rather. Okay? And notice that this is a cycle, so it's going to happen multiple times. Here's one cell cycle. And here's another. And then a third one is started, right? So this is going to happen multiple times until the cell gets too old, and we'll talk about that. But sometimes that whole cell cycle and all those traffic lights don't work properly. Sometimes, instead of being a red light where you have to stop and check yourself, you actually have a green light. And that can be really concerning because when you have a green light all the time, you're just going to keep going and 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 going. And if you remember what's happening each time we do the cell cycle, specifically the mitosis part, we're making two new cells. So we go from one cell in the cell cycle to two cells. And then each of them have a cell cycle. And so if they also have green lights, now I have 
four cells, and then they all have green lights, so now I'm going to have eight cells, right? And maybe there's mistakes in the DNA this whole time. Maybe these guys shouldn't be reproducing, but they have green lights, so they're just going to keep going. So this can result in cancer. So anytime you have unregulated cell growth, so the cells have green lights all the time and they just keep powering through and just keep making more and more cells, that's going to be called a tumor. Okay, So that's a mass of cells that has been formed because one cell kept dividing and dividing and dividing and its offspring kept dividing and dividing and dividing. Okay. Now, sometimes that's a malignant tumor and it doesn't spread. Okay. It's not technically cancer sometimes. Or excuse me, benign tumor, not malignant. Sometimes, however, it is a malignant tumor. It is a cancerous tumor and it will spread. And so what will happen there is basically some of those cells start to come off of this big tumor because this tumor is so big now. Some of the cells are going to come off and they are going to enter through a lymphatic through the lymphatic system and they're going to hit the lymph nodes and then basically that's like the highway for your body. It's going to be able to reach other places in your body. So maybe it started in the intestines and now you have it in your liver and you have it maybe reaching your brain, right? It's it's terrible and this is why it's so important to catch cancer early, right? To like get screened for cancer early, especially if you have like a genetic predisposition to cancers. So basically you want to catch it before it can spread because if we know where it is and it's only there, so if we know it's in the intestines, it's way easier to target it. But now that it could have moved to the whole lymphatic system, now it's in the liver, I'm going to have to target more areas of my body. I might not even get it all. And, so I'm going to make myself sicker and sicker and sicker. I'm really just poisoning different parts of my body, and hopefully I'll get it. And it's just a really terrible experience for that individual, right? So again, those tumors are the result of uncontrolled cell division, so those checkpoints aren't working properly. And so anytime you see a mass of cells that doesn't really fit, so like here's this mass of blue cells, it doesn't really fit, right? It doesn't look all nice and orderly like all of these did. So that's a good tell that a, can that a tumor, rather, is starting to form. Okay, And this can happen pretty much anywhere in your body. And it's going to be the result of a mutation in the genetic code. So something in your DNA changed, and then that has caused those lights to turn green and stay green. Now, here's a couple of extra videos to help you with cell cycle terms and the cell cycle process itself. We're going to practice this in class, of course, so I don't want you to freak out about it yet. But I would recommend that you look these videos up. You can just Google those phrases rather than typing in the entire URL. Um, but with that, that... Oh, actually, no, I am going to talk about mitosis today. Sorry, I thought that was a separate slideshow. So mitosis. Mitosis is critical. Uh, this is a very important process that you do need to understand well. So this is the process of the cell actually splitting into two cells. So that's what's happening here is I have one cell that is now becoming two cells. And if you'll recall, during interphase, the cells have grown and they've replicated their DNA, and then they're ready to start mitosis. And during mitosis, they're going to pass a complete genome, so an entire set of genes, from the parent cell to the two daughter cells, okay? So if my parent cell right here, so this is my parent, needs to create two identical daughter cells, then I'm going to take half of this whole X situation and half of this whole X situation, and they're going to end up in each cell, okay? So what that actually is is that, I'm going to see if I've got uh -huh, an eraser. So that is actually two DNA pieces. Okay, so here's a DNA piece. And then this is the replicated DNA piece. Okay, So those are identical. So this and this are identical. Anytime you have something that is identical, we call those sisters. Okay, so sisters in biology are going to refer to identical. And this whole thing is one big chromosome right now, but it's made up of two chromatids. 
Okay, so these are actually sister chromatids. And the same thing is happening with the red ones. I just only want to write it once, okay? And these are still identical by the time they've separated, but now we call them sister chromosomes because they're, own, they're their own unique thing. And we'll talk more about that terminology because it is confusing because chromosomes sometimes look like Xs and then sometimes they look like straight lines. And that's really confusing and really annoying, right? But mitosis is going to have its own stages that it breaks up into, okay? So there's replication, so the DNA replicated, that happened during the S phase. But then we have the prophase, the metaphase, the anaphase, and the telophase. Okay, so we have to talk about each of those separately. So again, DNA replicates during S phase. And so now I have two sister chromatids. If I can find my mouse here. Two sister chromatids, here's one and here's two. They're identical. They are conjoined at the centromere. So often you'll see a little depiction of like a circle in here holding those things together, sometimes not. So we call that the centromere. That's where it's being held together, okay? And basically right now, this is a chromosome and this is a chromosome. So I started at the bottom here. I had a single chromosome, one chromosome. And I still only have one chromosome, but it's made up of two chromatids. Okay? So it's kind of like all by itself. It's all attached. So anytime things are attached and they're like one cohesive unit, we're going to refer to that as a chromosome. Okay? So the first stage of mitosis is going to be prophase. So pro means before, right? So during prophase, and really all of the stages of mitosis are pretty logical, you have to think about what you want, what you have, and what you want, and how to get there. Okay, so everything that the cell does is something you would need to do if you were going to replicate this. So first your chromosomes are going to get really, really tight. They're going to coil up, and then they become so dense that we can actually see them through, you know, microscopes and whatnot. Okay, so these are dense now. They're very tightly coiled. Then you're going to have these things. These are called centrioles. You'll remember that from chapter six, the tour of the cell chapter. They're going to move to opposite ends, opposite poles of the cell. And then the centrioles are going to start forming these spindles. So that's these little spider legs coming off of it. Okay. So those are spindles. Those are going to become important later. And then the nucleolus is going to become invisible. So the nucleolus and the nuclear membrane are starting to break apart a little. That's because these chromosomes need to get out. They can't stay in the nucleus this whole time. So they need to get out. So in order to get them out, we're going to start breaking down the membrane. Okay? So by the end of prophase, the nuclear membrane is gone. And we start to have the spindle extending towards the chromosomes, okay? So just as a quick little exercise, take a quick second to think about which of these cells would be in prophase. I'll give you a quick second. Okay, so prophase is going to be when you start seeing the nuclear membrane detaching, okay? And you start to see the spindle forming. So, oops. so we don't have the chromosomes actually moving very much. Okay? It's pretty much staying where they started. So if you look here, they're kind of still in the middle, even though they're not held together by that nuclear membrane anymore. And the spindle fibers are starting to uh, extend. Okay? So this right here looks to me to be prophase. Okay, nothing's attached yet or anything like that, but we see the extension. Now, the second phase is called metaphase. So meta means middle. Okay, I mean, it doesn't, but it always reminds me of middle, okay, because they both start with M. And so basically, after that nuclear membrane is broken down, these chromosomes are going to start lining up in the middle. Okay, And so the fibers will keep developing, the microtubules will keep developing, OK? 
okay? And they'll eventually attach to the chromosomes. And then they're actually going to move them to the middle. They're going to line up right along the middle. Okay. And it says sister chromatid pairs align. That's because this part of the X is a sister chromatid and this part of the X is a sister chromatid. And they're just aligned along, along the equator of the cell. And the actual orientation, so whether it's like upside down and which one's on top, which one's on bottom, all that stuff, that's random. Okay, So there is some randomness here and that's going to be important later. But everything is lined up in the middle during metaphase. So what of these cells looks like it's in metaphase. Take a quick second. Okay. If you look at this cell right here, it's starting to line up around what could be an equator. Okay, it's not quite there, right? It's not lined up all nicely yet, but it's getting there. Okay. So after metaphase, we have what we call anaphase. So anaphase is when the chromosome, excuse me, the chromatids actually separate. Okay, we pull them apart. So that's what's happened here. We've gone from having this X to only half the X on each side. Okay. At this point, because they are now separated, each of these is now a chromosome. That's a chromosome. That's a chromosome. That's a chromosome. That's a chromosome. So they're no longer called sister chromatids. They are now chromosomes. They still have identical DNA, but they are chromosomes because they are their own thing now. They're separate. Okay. And all of that pulling is done by the microtubules, okay. by those long spider legs. The way I always remember that anaphase is when the chromosomes actually split apart is I just think of having like an ex-girlfriend named Anna, right? And we split up. Okay, So if that helps you remember, that's a mnemonic that I used in high school when I had to learn all this stuff. Okay. So just take a quick second. Think about which of these is in anaphase. Okay. This one's a little tough, okay? So it's clearly going to be either this one, labeled one, or this one, number two. So to me, this number two looks like it's still in metaphase. It looks like they're still pretty lined up along the equator. And up here, it looks like they've just separated. So here I would say number one is in anaphase, and two is still in metaphase, and we will practice with that. So the final stage for mitosis is telophase. So telo, just like telephone, means far, right? You communicate from far away. So telo means far. So this is when we go from anaphase, where the things have separated, to telophase, where they've really kind of gone to opposite ends of the cell. Okay, so see how they've really polarized. We get that, like, looks like cartoon eyes or something. They're still connected. We still technically have one cell, but they're really far apart. They almost look like two cells. It's really just like, hey, I got to cut this part. Okay, so we start to see the nuclear membrane reform because we want to protect that DNA as quickly as possible. So we start to see that reform in both cells and the chromosomes start to loosen up a bit. Okay, and now you really start to see two separate cells. Okay, now when it comes to recognizing telophase, you really just have to find the cells that are really that have two parts really far away from one another. So that's happening in two cells here. It's actually happening right here and right here. So this is cell one and it's happening in cell two here. Okay. So I have two different clumps of chromosomes in each of those. Okay. Now after telophase, we have this part where this needs to actually get cut. That's called cytokinesis. Okay, because we're cutting the cytoplasm basically in half to form two cells. Sometimes you'll see stuff referred to cytokinesis as being part of mitosis. Some people say it's after mitosis. It really doesn't matter for our class and for the AP test. Okay, just understand that telophase will end eventually with cytokinesis. Okay, so here's a nice slide for some practice. So I would pause the video here and try to recognize what stage each of these cells are in. And remember that cells might be in interphase, right? Cells spend most of their time in interphase. So just keep that in mind. So I'd pause the video and practice and we'll do some of this in class. Okay. But as I said, cytokinesis is going to be when you actually cut the two cells apart. And so this starts during telophase, but most people don't consider it part of mitosis. 
Yeah, so it's not part of mitosis generally. It doesn't really matter for our class though. And this is actually when we cut that cell into two. Okay? And this is basically like if you had a balloon and you kept twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting, like a water balloon, you kept twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting until eventually you have two separate water balloons. Okay? That's really all the cell did, is it really just kept twisting here with some proteins. Okay. <clears throat> Plant cells do this too. Uh, except it's more box shaped, right? And so you're going to see this same rectangular shape around the cells. Here are some extra videos that I would recommend. I absolutely love the crash course videos. I think they're really useful. Sometimes they go a little too quickly, but you can always go back and rewatch them. So I would recommend that you check out these videos for a little extra help. And that's going to do it for mitosis. You really need to understand the ins and outs of mitosis and the stages because we're going to revisit them not only for the AP test and, of course, for the unit test, but when we get to meiosis, which sounds very similar but is actually different, we're going to recall some of the stuff we saw during mitosis. So with that, that is going to be the end of the cell cycle and mitosis, and I will see you guys next time.